Hello, I'm Jay Jermaine Bay with Alodia Moore's Cranium, Monte, Colorado. The acronym is ANPAC. I am the Chief Judge of Consular Court. Uh, today is Class 23. Class 23. Uh, what did we learn in Class 22? Well, we started learning a little bit more about why Muhammad V, who was Sultan of Morocco, and then changed his status to Kingdom of Morocco because he became king, and now making the Empire of Morocco really on the classification of king of Morocco, making Morocco a kingdom more so than an empire, because he changed his status, right? He wanted independence. He became a modern state. But more specifically, what did we really find out about uh, Muhammad V? That because he was in a conspiracy now to get independence away from France, he decided to partner up the United States of America, claimed his independence through the United Nations, in 1956, which is not a problem, everybody has entitlement to their self-determination. However, what did he do in 1958? He threw the moors underneath the bus by removing Article 15 of the Treaty of 1880, Treaty of Madrid. Now keep in mind, he has changed his status to King of Morocco, not Sultan of Morocco, who drafted the Treaty of Madrid, 1880. A sultan. So always keep that in mind as we start talking about these not so little subtleties in the future as it relates to the kingdom of Morocco. But what, is, what do we really expose by learning something in class 22? The United States of America exposed one of their weaknesses. Think about it more. The United States of America needed the sultan, who's now a king of Morocco, to remove Article 15 of the Treaty of 1880. Why was that so important? It's because the United States of America, not to be confused, the United States realizes the answer to the test in order to get rid of their capitulation regime or their extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction or their compulsory jurisdiction or their impersonal jurisdiction or their territorial jurisdiction, what renounces that? More is coming back into the consciousness of self and then coming back into the consciousness of statehood. That is the answer to the test. So the United States of America exposed their weakness to all more. So understand, it's all about the government more. More importantly, what is the material fact that the United Nations started putting things on the record to let all indigenous people around the world understand the word indigenous is a contemporary term. But the indigenous people around the world, what do they need to do in order to get their sovereignty back? They need a state. But before a state, they need their nationality. Negro, blacks, and colors are the only ones on planet Earth that don't know their true nationality. Don't get me wrong, there are some other colonial islands around the world where people still call themselves a nom de guerre name, but they still think that's a nationality. But certainly, black, White, red, brown, and yellow is not a nationality by far. So Moors here in northwest of Mexico were the only ones truly afflicted because they didn't even have a starting point to get back to sovereignty because they didn't understand the definition of nationality. So therefore, Article 15 of the Treaty of Madrid talked about nationality because you can't come back to a Moroccan government unless you knew you was Moroccan. So therefore, the United States of America exposed their weakness. What else did it expose? The fact that Moors had not come back to a government even by the year 1958. Moors had not established a government. How could Muhammad V take away something if Moors already had it? That meant that we didn't have Moroccan governments at that time. Even to this very day, in the year 2021, we have maybe one, two, three, maybe four, five, de jure governments that Moors have created through their constitution and state because they've been following international law. But we're in the year 2021. When Muhammad V removed Article 15, that was 1958. So as we continuously learn about how do Moors get their sovereignty, we must always understand it's all about statehood. You can't have a state without a constitution, and you can't have a constitution without a nationality. Those three things go together, all right? So as we've been starting off lately in all our classes, we must stay cognizant of what is the mission and the vision of Moors. And that's to create the United States of Morocco. 
Now, when I say created, I say that in a contemporary way. But the reality is, it's always been Morocco. It's always been the United States of Morocco. There's just been an overlay of the United States of America on top of Morocco and their regencies, as George Washington called them. But there are these limestone buildings that are called capitals and museums. They're everywhere on planet Earth. You must understand that in the continent of America, contemporary word, they found over 2,000 pyramids just in the continent of America. They've only found about 300 pyramids in Africa. So you must understand, we already had government already in this continent. We're coming back into a reawakening, a restoration. We must understand repatriation instead of expatriation. So what we're doing is restoring our mental capacity to come back to something that was already well-settled principles to start running governments again. So let's jump back into the class, all right? With the class today, we're going to continuously start understanding what is our destination? What is the mission and vision? As we start to now really funnel this down to understanding the power of council of court, but understand, you can't have a council of court without a state. You can't have a state without a constitution. You can't have a constitution without a nationality, which creates all your stats. But status starts with state. Stat, state, stat. Status creates the state. So what are we trying to achieve ultimately, Lord? You see this a lot on t-shirts. Moors wear this symbol all the time. You see it quite often. This is what you call a desire. Moors desire to have Moroccan laws back based upon their jurisdiction. But this is the mission and the vision ultimately. But if Moors don't have what's called the discipline to study international law, then we'll never achieve this ultimate goal of creating our own Moroccan states again. You must understand that Dorothy was always home. She thought she was out of her jurisdiction. Come to find out, she was always home because it was in her head. So Moors, at home, I have a question for you. What is the name of your provincial state government? Because we must start with putting together the states. We need to come together as collective states by studying international law. Once we put together the collective states, then we can achieve our destination of the United States of Morocco. But how do we achieve it? It's called discipline. It's called studying international law. Moors must stop studying state statutes. I say again. Moors must stop studying state statutes. Why? Because it was just an exercise to get Moors back in the consciousness of enforcing law. We were always afraid of law. We knew the penalty of law, but we never studied law. Now Moors over the last 10, 20, 30 years have been studying state statutes and studying the Constitution for the United States of America so we can get back into practice and understanding how do you enforce a law. But now Moors must start studying international law. If we ever want to get here, then we must enforce Moroccan law, Sharifan law, which is really Moorish law because everything started with the Moors. It started with the Moors first, then it went into Sharif and law. But never forget that it's Moorish land. Guess who exposed that when we read that in, in class number 22? What, we, what did we find out? That France recognized the Amazai people had a totally different jurisdiction than the Arabs. We found out that the Amazai people were the indigenous people of the land branded as Berbers. 
we found out that the Arabs really have an overlap, an overlay in the land, Asiatic land of the Moors. So Moors at home must understand it's always been Moorish land. Then it became Sharifan law. But it's now a combination of two because we've mixed the bloodlines. Dynasties have mixed with indigenous people. That's okay. We're all brothers and sisters. But you must always understand, everything starts off with Moors. Then you enforce Sharif and law of the land. Okay? So today, what I'd like to go over uh, is constantly understanding, once Moors come back into the consciousness of government, how do we defend our rights? We must continuously study the fundamentals of international law. And international law comes to the United Nations Charter, all their declarations, the conventions, and more importantly, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is nothing but a, a, a consular court. So we must study consular court, or else your matriarchal council will not have any power of government. Your executive branch of your government will not have any power without consular court. Why? Consular court, courts around the world, are the gatekeepers of your sovereignty. Your consular courts must be in honor. Your entire government must be de jure. You can't be self-appointed. So let's continuously learn about international law. Okay, Moors. So Moors at home, this is the, the International Court of Justice Handbook. We're going to go down to page 176, and we're going to do a little research, a little analysis of a court case of Germany, Germany versus the United States of America, all right? Okay, so page 176, this is the court case out of, out of the International Criminal Court, excuse me, uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, it's called the Lagrand, Germany versus United States of America. Why are we going over this? Morris must start understanding how to go back and read case law, how to read precedent. Why? Because Morris can use a lot of these cases to understand how do you use your defense against a foreign state? How do you use your defense against municipal corporations that are working under the guise of the states of the United States of America? All right? So that's why we're studying this. It gives you reference points that way you can go back and start learning what international law is based upon the fundamentals of international law. All right? So if I can have the mothers go ahead and start reading this. Lagrange, Germany versus United States of America. On 2nd March 1999, the Federal Republic of Germany filed in the registry of the court an application instituting proceedings against the United States of America in a dispute concerning alleged violations of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations of 24 April 1963. Germany stated that in 1982, the authorities of the state of Arizona had detained two German nationals, Carl and Walter Legrand who were tried and sentenced to death without having been informed of their rights, as is required under Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention. Germany also alleged that the failure to, to provide the required notification precluded Germany from protecting its nationals' interests provided for by Articles 5 and 36 of the Vienna Convention. At both the trial and the appeal level in the United States courts, Germany asserted that although the two nationals finally, with the assistance of German consular officers, did claim violations of the Vienna Convention before the federal courts, the latter applying the municipal law doctrine of procedural default decided that because the individuals in question had not asserted their rights in the previous legal proceedings at state level, they could not assert them in the federal proceedings. In his application, Germany based the jurisdiction of the court on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court 
and on the article I, is that I? One. One of the optional protocol of the Vienna Convention on Counselor Relations. Stop. So, so far, what we're learning already, what's being identified is Germany, Germany versus United States of America. Once again, this is another chess game of understanding how do you use international law to your advantage when you're dealing with the United States, who is now doing something against one of your nationals. Now, I say this again for the record. Everything that we talk about in these impact study sessions are about more coming back into the consciousness of government. These are study sessions. But any more who now goes out and starts talking about they have a state provincial government, knowing they didn't put together a state provincial government, you're acting in dishonor if you're using some of these uh, international law fundamentals just submit documentation without putting together a government. That's called being dishonored. So let's get back to this text. What's happening? So point of reference again, what's the reference point? The International Court of Justice Handbook. All more should have that as a part of their library. Germany versus United States of America. On March 2nd, March 1999, the Federal Republic of Germany filed in the registry of the court an application instituting proceedings against the United States of America. You notice it doesn't say United States. United States of America. Why? On an international level, they are the United States of America, not the United States, even though the courts in other states around the world refer to them as the United States, but they know they're two separate entities. Only Negroes, black, and colors, and everybody thinks they're a crayon, or think they're American as nationality, think that the United States and the United States of America is the same thing. But international communities know it's different. The United States of America, in a dispute con concerning alleged violations of the Vienna Convention on Council Relations on 24 April 1963. So 1963, they're referencing now what? The Vienna Convention on Council Relations. We're going to go over that in just a minute. Germany stated that in 1982, the authorities of the state of Arizona had detained two German nationals, German nationals, German nationals, German nationals. Did they say white people? No. Did they say German subjects? No. Did they say protégés? No. They said German nationals. So the Moors refer to each other. You must refer to yourself as what? Moorish nationals, Moroccan nationals. You must be a national, but you can't be a national according to international law unless you have now gone through a state to gain your sovereign rights. Carl and Walter Legrand, who were tried and sentenced to death without having been informed to their rights as required under Article 36, Paragraph 1b, as is required under Article 36, Paragraph 1b, as required. Talking international law, these are requirements of the Vienna Convention. Germany also alleged that the failure to provide the required notification precluded Germany from protecting its nationals, not its subjects, not its protégés, and not its white people, nationals, interest provided for by Article 5. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now let's go back now. More at home studying. How do you defend your state sovereignty? Use some of these fundamental principles of international law. Now we must go to the Vienna Convention on Council Relations of April of 1963. Right? It's more at home. Research, find the Vienna Convention on Council Relations, 1963. So page 15 in your PDF, all right? So if I can have the mothers read um, Article 36, Part 1, and then Part B, 1B. Article 36, Communication and Contact with the Nationals of the Sending State. With a view to facilitating the exercise of counselor functions relating to nationals of the sending state. If he is so request, 
the competent authorities of the receiving state shall, without delay, inform the counselor post of the sending state if within its counselor district a national of that state is arrested, are committed to prison, are to custody pending trial, or is detained in any other manner, any communication addressed to the counselor post by the person arrested in prison, custody, or detention shall be forwarded by the said authorities without delay. The said authorities shall inform the person concerned without delay of his rights under this subparagraph. All right, so Germany is immediately doing what? They're not, they're, they're going straight into international law. Let's keep in mind, let's go back to the report. Keep in mind, Germany stated that in 1982, the authorities of the state of Arizona. See, Germany's not talking about state statutes. They went right into international law, right? First thing they did, they started talking about consular relations, dealing with one of their nationals who was detained and was now standing trial, okay? Criminal court. So Moors at home must understand, when you start dealing with some of your nationals who are now being detained so-called in custody, more or less really in what's called internment. Internment meaning they're really being held like a prisoner of war. So when you start understanding how to deal with your nationals, start understanding how Germany deals with these situations when their nationals are being captured by the United States of America. That should be the mindset of Moors right now. They went right into what? Article 36, paragraph 1B to enforce United States of America's obligations. So now we looked up Article 36, Paragraph 1B of the, uh, 1B of the Vienna Convention. Germany also alleged that the failure to provide the required notification precluded Germany from protecting its national interests provided for by Article 5 and 36 of the Vienna Convention. So now what are we talking about? Now they're jumping back on the Vienna Convention of what? 1969. So now you've got the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. So Moors, take notes. Understand, you need to add this to your library. So immediately, what is Germany doing? They're going right into obligations of the United States of America when you're talking about state-on-state -state disputes and dealing with nationals. Not subjects, not protégés, not crayon, nationals. They point out Article 5 and 36. So let's go to 5 and 36. Okay, mom, if I can have you read Article 5. Treaties constituting international organizations and treaties adopted within an international organization. The present convention applies to any treaty which is the constituent instrument of an international organization and to any treaty adopted within an international organization without prejudice, prejudice. prejudice to any relevant rules of the organization. So what does this mean? Listen to what Germany's saying. Germany's saying, the present convention applies to any treaty which is the, in which, in which is the constitutes instrument of an international organization. What's the international organization? UN Charter, as well as all other states that are obligated to the UN Charter, and to any treaty adopted. The United States of America has adopted the United Nations Charter as well as all treaties with Germany, etc., within an international organization without prejudice to any relevant rules of the organization. So Germany's telling the United States of America, it's irrelevant that the state of Arizona has something to do with our national. That's irrelevant. What is the supreme law of the land? The treaties, as well as the United Nations Charter that's governed by the ICJ. The ICJ is the police. So therefore, now Germany is reporting the United States of America to the UN, and now it's gone up to the police, which is the ICJ. And now they're taking a look at this. So what, what should Moors understand? When Germany's taking a look at this, they're pulling out certain subsections of international law. Moors must study international law. You must stop studying state statutes. Study international law, like Germany is using international law right now. So, also, Article 36. Let's 
go down to Article 36. Article 36 is on page 14 of the Vienna Convention of 1969. Okay, motherfucker, have you read that? Article 36. Treaties providing for rights for third states. One, a right arises for a third state from a provision of a treaty if the parties to the treaty intend the provision to accord that right either to the third state or to a group of states to which it belongs or to all states. The third state... Assent. There too, its assent shall be presumed so long as the contrary is not indicated unless the treaty otherwise provides. A state exercising a right in accordance with paragraph 1 shall comply with the conditions for its exercise provided for in the treaty are established in conformity with the treaty. Okay. Now, more keep in mind, in previous classes, we talked about the fact that the United States is a third state. We talked about there's several states are third states. Why are they third states? Because they're not parties to the treaty. The parties must be known on any contract. So who are the de jure parties on the contract of Treaty of Peace and Friendship? It's Morocco and the United States of America. But in this particular scenario, Jeremy's pointing out that the state of Arizona did something to their national. Arizona is a third state because Arizona's name is not on the treaty. However, Arizona is part and parcel to the United States. So they are obligated to the treaty. Why? Because the United States is obligated to the United States of America. The United States of America is obligated to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. They're all part and parcel. They're all obligated no matter what. So in the Vienna Convention, you can also go back and read Article 3. It talks about the fact that the United States is still obligated to the Vienna Convention, even though they're doing business as the United States. And there are several states. But they're still obligated to the treaty under the United States of America. All right? AMPAC is a party to the treaty. That's right. So AMPAC is a party to the treaty, but AMPAC technically is a third state because Morocco is the true party of the contract. So AMPAC falls under Morocco, pre-existing, existing under Morocco, you see? So we're two third states dealing with each other, but where do we get our delegation authority order? Morocco, and they get theirs from the United States of America. That's how it works, all right? We're part and parcel to the East state. Mm -hmm. So everything's working through the state. So Arizona is a, is, a, is a provincial state government working through the United States of America. ANPAC is a provincial state government working through the East State of Morocco. Morocco and the United States of America are the parties to the contract. But we as Moors are descendants, successors of said right to that contract. All right? Okay, so what's happening here in Article 36? Treaties providing for rights of third states, that's in the Vienna Convention, to recognize those parties who still have an obligation who are calling themselves states. So Germany is saying this, a right, a right arises for a third state, Arizona, from a provision of a treaty if the parties to the treaty intended the provisions to accord that right either to the third state or to a group of states to which it belongs. Arizona belongs to who? The United States of America. Or to all states, and the third state assents thereto. So the third state is obligated to the United States of America. The United States of America is obligated to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which Germany is now saying Arizona still had obligations, regardless of the name of that party. That party is part and parcel of the United States of America. Its assent shall be presumed so long as the contrary is not indicated unless the treaty otherwise provides. What does that mean? Arizona is not saying they're not a party to the contract. They didn't say objection to a treaty. They left it move. That's acquiescence saying, yes, they're a party to the contract. 
unless they put on the record something contrary. They did not. Part two, a state exercising a right in accordance with paragraph one shall comply with conditions for its exercise provided for in the treaty or established in conformity with the treaty. Everything's about treaties. Arizona state or the state of Arizona was obligated regardless. So more than home, you must understand the several states are obligated to the Vienna Convention of Consular Relations of 1963, and the United States of America and several states are obligated to the Vienna Convention of 1969. Germany's pointing this out. <laughs> Let's start here. Germany also alleged that the failure to provide the required notification precluded Germany from protecting its national interests provided for by Articles 5 and 36 of the Vienna Convention at both the trial and the appeal level. In the United States courts, they say United States of America, United States courts, Germany asserted that although the two nationals, finally with the assistance of German consular officers, did claim violations of the Vienna Convention before the federal courts, the latter applying the municipal law doctrine of what's called a procedural default decided that because the individuals in question had not asserted their rights in the previous legal proceedings at state level. So in Arizona, they did not claim consular court or they was Germans. They did not ask for consular relations to get involved. They could not assert them on the federal proceedings. What happened? The United States of America is making up statutes that blocks nationals from their own sovereign rights to treaties. What is the United States of America doing? Like I told you, they stall, deny, and defend their statutes over treaties until you say objection. And even when you say objection, what do they do? They still try to strong arm you, which is crimes against humanity. This is why the ICC was created, the International Criminal Court, in 1998 and started its main trials in the year 2002 is because things like this, the United States of America was not obliging to treaties. So even though the ICJ will come out with reports and tell states what to do, the United States of America is just rolled. So therefore, they had to create the ICC in 1998. Officially, they started looking at court cases in 2002 because of things like this, the United States of America. Okay, here we go. In its application, Germany based the jurisdiction of the court on Article 36, paragraph, paragraph 1 of the statute of the court. Listen more than home. There's two documents we're going to go over. One, we're going to go backwards, and we're going to look at what they call this protocol default, okay? Then we're going to get into the statute of the court, Article 1. So let's go back a little bit. This word right here. What is procedural default? State of Arizona pulled this out the bag. The feds pulled this out the bag. They've created a statute called what? Procedural default. What is that? If I can have the mother read this, please. Procedural default doctrine law and legal definition. Procedural default doctrine is a legal principle which says that federal courts cannot review the merits of a habeas corpus petition if a state court has refused to review the complaint because the petitioner failed to follow reasonable state court procedures. The purpose of this doctrine is to ensure that state prisoners are not only State prisoners not only become ineligible for state relief before raising their claims in federal court, but also that they give state courts a sufficient opportunity to decide those claims before doing so. The procedural default doctrine precludes federal review of a state court's habeas decision when the state court's decision was based on adequate and independent state law, or when the federal issue was not fairly presented to the state courts 
and those courts would now hold the claim procedurally barred. The doctrine requires that petitioners fairly present their claims in concrete, practical terms so that the state court is sufficiently alerted to the federal constitutional nature of the issue. Okay, so what are we learning? The states and the feds created statutes so they can have what's called plausible denial of what they're doing on these different municipal levels. So therefore, the state says, oh, well, you foreign national, you didn't fill out the paperwork right, or you didn't say this correctly on the record. The feds are saying, well, we don't want to get involved with states because states have state rights. According to the Bill of Rights, Article 10, state rights. So therefore, the feds are acting like they don't want to get involved because the state is saying, well, they haven't met the qualifications for us to even push it to a federal level. The feds are saying they can't get involved because the state is not giving us permission to get involved. So they're playing this plausible denial game because it's all about commerce and just locking people up and just being rolled. Okay, so now that we read a little bit about what's called, as Morris put this in their library, this is the game that the United States of America and their several states are playing if Morris do not follow what they call their procedural default doctrine of law, which is statutes. But guess what Germany's gonna come back with? That's, that's irrelevant. Treaties the supreme law of the land. So from here, the procedure default decided that because the individual in question had not asserted their rights in the previous legal proceedings at state level, they could not assert them in the federal proceedings. In its application, Germany based the jurisdiction of the court on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court and on Article 1 of the Optional Protocol of the Vienna Convention on Council Relations. So more at home as you're studying, we're about to go through now a different document that you need to add to your library. Now more at home, when you look up United Nations Charter, the United Nations Charter of 1945 has not only the United Nations Charter, but also in it has the ICJ statutes. But you can also find the ICJ statutes as a standalone document, okay? All right. So the statute on International Court of Justice, this is the International Court of Justice statutes that Moors must have in their library, okay? So what did Germany put on the record? They said to go to Article 36, Paragraph 1. Uh, 1. The jurisdiction of the court comprises all cases which the parties refer to, it and all matters especially provided for in the Charter of the United Nations or in treaties and conventions in force. So what happened? Germany is pointing out, United States of America, y'all have obligations according to treaties, and they're in force. Not only are they in force, the ICJ oversees these treaties. The Vienna Convention of 1969 is the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. So regardless of what the German national said that was detained and going through pretrial and trial, as soon as he said he was German national, immediately all proceedings were supposed to stop to allow Germany to now deal with their national. The habeas corpus was not being accepted by the United States of America. They kept pushing forward. That's called usurpation, okay? So, Article 36, the jurisdiction of the court comprises all the cases which the parties, who are the parties, only states, refer to it in all matters specially provided for in the Charter of the United Nations or in treaties and conventions and forth. What did Germany do? They put it all together in that one paragraph. It said, not only are you obligated to United Nations Charter, but you're obligated to treaties, not your state local statutes. You'll learn more about that when Germany specifically says it on the record. What, why are we going over this? So more to build out their library and understanding, here are some of the themes you can use when your nationals are dealing with the usurpation of a third state.
All right, so now we're going to go over Article 1 of what's called the Optional Protocol of the Vienna Convention on Council Relations. There's another document that the United Nations has that Moors need to have on in their library. Okay, here we go. This is called the Optional Protocol Concerning the Compulsory Settlement of Disputes. Why are we going over this? Moors must start learning how to use consular court to their advantage. How are we going to use consular court if you don't know the, understand the fundamental principles of which laws to use to exercise, right? Keep in mind, consular court secures the state, state's rights. The state's rights secures consular court. Consular court and the state work hand in hand with each other, all right? So now let's go over the optional protocol concerning the compulsory settlement of disputes, 1963. Why are we going over this? Because Germany pointed out optional protocol of the Vienna Convention on consular relations, so we're going to go right into Article 36, Paragraph 1. Okay, so Article 1 of the optional protocol. If I have another read, please. Um, disputes arising out of the interpretation or application of the convention shall lie within the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and may accordingly be brought before the court by an application made by any party to the dispute being a party to the present protocol. All right, so what's happening? Why is Germany mentioning this? Let's read it. Dispute. So Germany's having a dispute with who? United States of America and Arizona as a state, third state. Disputes arising out of the interpretation of or applications of the convention shall lie within the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. What is Germany saying? There's a dispute over interpretation of what law to use. So Germany's saying, hold up. Who are we supposed to go talk about when we have a dispute? You must take it to the UN, the ICJ charter, right? Disputes arising out of the interpretation of the application of the convention shall lie within the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and may accordingly be brought before the court by an application made by any party to the dispute, being a party to the present protocol. So Germany is now saying, this is why we brought this to the UN. They're telling the UN, they're telling the ICJ, we brought this here because of this. This is what Germany's putting out, putting on the table to the ICJ. ICJ, you're obligated because we have a national that's been detained in custody and going through trial with the United States of America, more specifically, the state of Arizona being a third state. So more must understand these things. Let's continue. Start right here, Mother Germany. Thank you. My time is like time. I'll go ahead and try again. Germany accompanied its application by an urgent request for the indication of provisional measures, requesting the court to indicate that the United States should take all measures at its disposal to ensure that one of its nationals, whose date of execution had been fixed at 3 March 1999, was not executed pending final judgment in the case. On 3 March 99, the court delivered an order for the indication of provisional measures calling upon the United States of America, among other things, to quote unquote, take all measure, measures at its disposal to ensure that the German national was not executed, executed pending the final decision in the proceedings. However, the two German nationals were executed by the United States. Stop. Boy, at home, listen to me. The United States of America does not have respect for any nationals around the world. It's not just Moors. Moors, stop taking it personal. Moors, you must treat this like business. You must follow the proper protocols in order to enforce your consular courts to get these foreigners now to give them direct instructions through consular court. Even the ICJ, as you can see, trying to come to the rescue of a foreign national, of Germany. Keep in mind, the United States of America says Germany is their closest ally. Mm -hmm. 
in the United States of America through their Arizona state, even at the federal level, still executed our German national. You must understand the United States of America is rogue. This is why all Moors must come together as a collective. Now, you're going to learn later on in this report, the ICJ did deal with the United States of America, but we're going to pause here for a minute. Moors must stop thinking that it's just Moors as United States of America bullies. The United States of America is a bully on a global stage. They're waiting, all nationals around the world are waiting for the Moors to wake up. Why? Because we can enforce Article 24, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, and put an end to this mayhem because only Moors can petition the intent to abandon the Treaty of Peace and Friendship at any time. Only Moors have control over this belligerent municipal corporation that's going around the world to and fro, devouring nations. Moors must understand it ain't just us Moors that they pick on. They pick on everybody, including the ICJ. Thus the reason why the ICC had to be created, because of what the United States of America does. They're not the only bad character on the global stage, but in the race of Moors dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. A lot of nationals deal with them as well as Moors. Let's continue. Public hearings in the case were held from 13 to 17 November 2000. In its judgment of 27 June 2001, the court began by outlining the history of the dispute and then examined certain objections of the United States of America to the court's jurisdiction and to the admissibility of Germany's submissions. It found that it had jurisdiction to deal with all Germany's submissions and that they were admissible. Stop. See what the United States of America did? Did mm -hmm. you catch it? Listen. Public hearings in the case were held from the 13th to the 17th of November 2000. In his judgment of 27 June 2001, the court began by outlining the history of the dispute and then examine certain objections of the United States of America. The United States of America always rejects everybody's jurisdiction. They're claiming Germany don't have jurisdiction. They'll say the ICJ doesn't have jurisdiction. That's the reason why the ICC had to be created. That way they could create an international criminal court to deal with criminals. Now notice, as we go back, the ICJ, the court, the ICJ, the court delivered an order for the indication of provisional measures calling upon the United States of America. They didn't say United States. Mm -hmm. They called the United States of America. That's what's on the record. The parties must be known to stop what they were doing. That's what you call an injunctive relief. The ICJ gave the United States of America an injunctive relief to stop what they were doing. The United States of America moved forward, right? And did what? Executed. They executed the German. Who executed the German? The United, United States. The United States. You have to catch how the ICJ is writing more. They're making distinctions. Mm -hmm. They know the United States is rogue. They know the United States operates as the United States of America on an international level, but operates as the United States locally. They know this. They're making distinctions. That's why I always say, two separate entities, don't get them confused. Because the ICJ, the international community, knows they're two separate entities. It's just that us Moors who are just not waking up in the consciousness just not learning this. But the international community knows this. What's the second point I want to make? That the United States of they're right here. I'm starting from the top. Make it clean. Public hearings in the case were held from 13 to the 17th of November 2000. In its judgment of 27 June 2001, the court began by outlining the history of the dispute and then examined certain objections of the United States of America. So who brought the case to the German ultimately? 
United States of America, because it started off locally at the state level, then it went to Fed, United States of America picked that case up. United States of America versus this German national. So the IC, ICJ is giving the United States of America an order. So it's the United States of America, ultimately, that really executed them. Mm -hmm. But the United States of America is operating as the United States who execute them under the guise of the United States of America. You gotta understand, two separate entities. This is what you call a cartel. The United States of America is not a country. It's a municipal corporation maintaining a cartel. You must study cartel on an international level to understand what that means. Listen to this. So the courts recognized the courts did have jurisdiction and Germany did have jurisdiction. It found that it had jurisdiction to deal with all Germany submissions and that they were admissible. Well, who, who had jurisdiction? ICJ had jurisdiction. The United States of America and Germany both had jurisdiction to deal with this dispute because of the treaties and the charters. You must understand, we're talking international law. Notice Germany is not saying, according to a state of Arizona statute, you can't do this. No. Germany's talking international law while the United States of America is talking what? Statutes. You must understand the United States of America runs this game on everybody, not just Moors. Continue, Mother. Ruling on the merits of the case, the court observed that the United States did not deny that in relation to, no, to Germany, it had violated Article 36, Paragraph 1b of the Vienna Convention which required the competent authorities of the United States to inform the Lagrands of their right to have the Consulate of Germany notified of their arrest. It added that in the case concerned, that breach had led that breach had led to the violation of paragraph 1A and paragraph 1C of that article. respectively, with mutual rights of communication and access of consular officers and their nationals, and the right of consular officers to visit their nationals in prison and to arrange for their legal representation. The court further stated that the United States had not only breached its obligations to Germany as a state party to the convention, but also that there had been a violation of the individual rights of the Lagrands under Article 36, Paragraph 1, which rights could be relied on before the court by their national state. Stop. Okay, let's go back, comprehend what's taking place. Why are we going over this? Because Moors are using consular court as their defense. So let's learn how Germany, United States of America, how Germany dealt with the United States of America through a court. Because when Moors put together consular courts, we have to deal with the United States of America through our consular courts locally. So let's learn the library of fundamental law that we use to deal with the United States of America. Ruling on the merits of, of, of the case, the court observed that the United States did not deny that. Did not deny what? That they didn't follow international law. In relations to Germany, it had violated Article 36, Paragraph 1b, of the Vienna Convention. Now we read that, okay? Which required the competent authorities of the United States to inform the Lagrands of their right to have consulate of Germany notified of their arrest. What happened? Remember now, on the state level, Arizona, and they have Fed. So what the Feds are saying, since Lagrand and Germans didn't do what they're supposed to do on the state level, they had no rights on the federal level, even though Germany showed up eventually. Germany showed up into the game, right, to represent their nationals. By the time Germany showed up, it was on the federal level. Yeah. And the United States of America saying, thank you for coming to the party, but you're late. Your nationals didn't do what they were supposed to do on the state level with Arizona. So therefore, ain't nothing you can do to help them on the federal level. We're about to start a barbecue party. You got to understand, the United States of America just rolled. So what's happening? Now we need to go back and still read again Article 36, Paragraph 1b, 1a, and 1c, okay, of the article. What are we talking about? Cost of notification.
Okay, so Article 36. Let's read 1, A, B, and C. Okay, Mother, Article 36. Communication and contact with nationals of the sending states. Stop. So who's the sending state in this scenario? Germany. They're sending what? They're sending correspondence to the United States of America. They're sending correspondence to the UN. Secretary General then went to the ICJ, so they're the sending state. The United States of America would be, be called the receiving state or responding state. Okay, well, we can start from Article 36. One, with a view to facilitating the exercise of consular functions relating to nationals of the sending states. A, consular officers shall be free to communicate with nationals of the sending states and to have access to them. Nationals of the sending states shall have the same freedom with respect to communication with and access to consular officers of the sending states. B. If he so requests, the competent authorities of the receiving state shall without delay inform the consular post of the sending state if within its consular district a national of that state is arrested or committed to prison or to custody pending trial or is detained in any other manner. Any communication addressed to the consular post by the person arrested in prison, custody, or detention shall be forwarded by the said authorities without delay. The said authority shall inform the person concerned without delay of its rights under this subparagraph. C. The consular officers shall have the right to visit a national of the sending state who is in prison, custody, or detention to converse and correspond with him and to arrange for his legal representation. They shall also have the right to visit any national of the sending state who is in prison, custody, or detention in their district in pursuance of a judgment. Nevertheless, consular officers shall refrain from taking action on behalf of a national who is in prison, custody, or detention if he expressly opposes such action. All right, so, so what's happening in Article 36? This is what you call your constant notification and access. Mm -hmm. That the United States of America, including its several states, mm -hmm. as soon as they're dealing with a foreign national, so-called in their jurisdiction, they now have to give that foreign national certain rights if, in fact, that foreign national, who's now in a so-called someone else's host jurisdiction, they're now abroad in someone else's host jurisdiction, they still have certain rights that follow them from their host country. So Germans, coming from Germany, coming over to the jurisdiction of the United States of America, still have rights even though they're in the United States of America as being nationals. Even though they're being detained or in custody or in pre-trial or going through trial, they must always have proper representation no matter what. So therefore, the United States of America denied the, these, these Ger German nationals, the Lagrands, on the state level. By the time it went to federal level, yeah, they let Germany come in, but by that time, they said Germany didn't have no rights over their own nationals. They basically treated these foreign nationals in what's called pro se. Treated them as if they were citizens of the United States. And that goes against international law. Okay, let's continue. The court then turned to Germany's submission that the United States, by applying rules of its domestic law, in particular, the doctrine of procedural default had violated Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the Convention. That provision required the United States to enable full effect to be given to the purposes for which the rights accorded under Article 36 were intended. The court stated that in itself, the procedural default rule did not violate Article 36. The problem arose, according to the court, when the rule in question did not allow the detained individual to challenge a conviction and sentence by invoking the failure of the competent national authorities to comply with their obligation under Article 36, Paragraph 1. The court concluded that in the present case, the procedural default rule had the effect of preventing Germany from assisting the Lagrands in a timely fashion as provided for by the Convention. 
Under those circumstances, the court held that in the present case, the rule referred to violated Article 36, Paragraph 2. Stop. Okay. So now let's go back and read Article 36, Paragraph 2. We read it before Article 1. So now we're going to go to Article um, 2. Now, what are they referring to? The, the Treaty of the uh, Treaty of, um, of Vienna, 1969. So they're jumping back and forth. You got to catch it. One is the Vienna Treaty of 1963 for Consular Notification and Access, which is called Consular Relations. The other one is the Vienna Treaty of 1969 that governs all treaties. So they're going back and forth between these two documents, okay? So now we're going to the 1969 Treaty of Vienna. Articles 1 and 2. We read Article 1, now let's read Article 2 as well. So let's, let's start from the top, Article 36. Article 36, treaties providing for the rights of third states. One, a right arises for a third state from a provision of a treaty if the parties to the treaty intend the provision to accord that right either to the third state or to a group of states to which it belongs or to all states and the third state assents thereto. Its assent shall be presumed so long as the contrary is not indicated unless the treaty otherwise provides. Two, a state exercising a right in accordance with paragraph one shall comply with the condition for its exercise provided for in the treaty or established in conformity with the treaty. Okay, so what is Germany saying? <laughs> Germany is saying the United States of America, America didn't conform. <laughs> when they first told them, not, Germany told the United States of America, we don't care if it's at the Arizona state level or federal level. That's all domestic statutes. <laughs> it's irrelevant. It's moot. Treaties is a supreme law of the land, and the treaties are governed by the Vienna Convention of 1969. Therefore, you get to use the Vienna Convention of Council Relations of 1963, and all of those are governed by what? The United Nations Charter, and the United States of America is obligated to the Charter as well as to treaties. So Germany is now not talking local statute. They're talking international law. That's why Moors must study international law. Germany saying it's irrelevant. Now keep in mind, now they've already assassinated these German nationals. Now what is Germany doing now? Just taking it, now ICJ said, okay, now that they've done it, that's, we gotta do something about this. So they're talking to the ICJ, look at what they violated. So ICJ comes out and says what? ICJ says the problem arose according to the court when the rule in question did not allow the detained individual to challenge a conviction and sentence by invoking the, familiar, the failure of the competent national authorities to comply with their obligations under Article 36, Paragraph 1. The court concluded that, the court concluded that, in the present case, the procedural default rule had the effect of preventing Germany, Germany from assisting the Lagrands in a timely fashion as provided for by the convention. Under those circumstances, the court held that in the present case, the rule referred to violated Article 36, Paragraph 2. You see how specific international law is being? They didn't say they violated Article 1, they said they violated Article 2. ICJ said they violated Article 2. What was Article 2? Article 6, Section 2. A state exercising a right in accordance with Paragraph 1 shall comply with the conditions for exercise provided for in the treaty or established in conformity with the treaty. What happened? It's all about treaties. Mm -hmm. So not only did Arizona State violate the treaty, but the United States violate the treaty because the United States is a third state as well. Mm -hmm. They're not the United States of America. They're a third state. You must understand that. So the ICJ comes out and said they didn't violate Article 1, excuse me, Section 1, they violated Section 2. What should Morris learn from this? Keep in mind, this is precedent. We're reading precedent law that Morris can use now and forever. 
when they're dealing with our foreign nationals that have been detained in custody, free trial, going through trial, everything must stop so that consular notification and access takes place. We'll keep talking about that. With regard to the alleged violation by the United States of the court's order of 3 March 1999, indicating provisional measures, the court pointed out that it was the first time it had been called upon to determine the legal effects of such orders made under Article 41 of its statute, the interpretation of which had been the subject of extensive controversy in the literature. After interpreting Article 41, the court found that such orders did have binding effect. In the present case, the court concluded that its order of 3 March 99 was not a mere exhortation, but created a legal obligation for the United States. The court then went on to consider the measures taken by the United States to implement the order concerned and concluded that it had not complied with it. Stop. So right there, there, ICJ is letting the United States of America know you violated the treaties, you violated the declarations, you violated the United Nations Charter. We gave you a direct order to stop what you were doing, and you did not. So what are they using under their statute? They're looking at saying, now the United States of America did this, what's the penalty? Now, what, why are they pointing, where's the penalty? Article 41 of its statute. What statute? United Nations Charter. So more at home, write this down, add it to your library. What is the penalty that the ICJ can use towards any state that disregards a court order? How did the court ICJ hold a foreign state in contempt of court? All right, now we go to Article 41 of the Charter of the United Nations. All right, so here is the Charter of the United Nations. Keep in mind, the Charter of the United Nations also includes the statutes of the International Court of Justice. It's all combined, but what I read to y'all today, I looked up a different separate PDF that has the statutes of the International Court of Justice. They're two separate documents, but at the same time, you can find it all combined under this one, okay? 1945. All right, so, all right, we're going to go down to Article 41. Okay, keep in mind, why are we getting ready to read Article 41? Because the ICJ is looking at, since the United States of America did not listen to the direct orders of the ICJ, what is the penalty? What can the ICJ use, right? Okay, we have Mother read Article 41. Article 41, the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be... employed to give effect to its decisions, and it may call upon the members of the United Nations to apply such measures. These may include complete or partial interruption of economic relations and of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraphic, radio, and other means of communication, and the severance of diplomatic relations. All right, let's read that again. Let's interpret what happens. <laughs> it's, it's plain English, so let's take a look. Now understand, when a state does not listen to the direct orders of ICJ, what is their remedy? Article 41, more than home, add this to your library. That way we understand, well, if United States don't listen to the ICJ, what's going to happen? Here's the answer. Article 41, the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force. Why does the ICJ and the UN say not to use armed force? Because they are all out there promoting equality and peace. No weapons of mass destruction should be used. So what does the ICJ say they can use instead of weapons of mass destruction? Sanctions. Sanctions. What do these sanctions look like? Employed to give effect to a decision, and it may call upon the members of the United Nations to apply such measures. So what do they do? The members of the United Nations come together. Other nations come together as a committee to figure out, okay, what should we do about a state that's rogue? that did not listen to the ICJ report. They, in other words, they vote on it. Okay, watch. What are they voting on? These may include complete or partial interruptions of economic relations. 
Isn't that what it says in the Act of Al Jazeera's Article 102? It says, Moors, through the Sharifan Authority, have a right to do what? Impose fines, penalties, and confiscations. That's the same thing the UN can, they have that same power to deal with states. These may include complete or partial interruptions of economic relations and of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraphic, radio, and other means of communication and severance of diplomatic relations. So you must understand, what does the ICJ do? They put you in time out by hurting you economically. That's how they'll deal with it. All right? So Morris must understand, when the United States of America, when Morris win against the United States of America, the ICJ still has obligations to make sure the United States of America carries through with those orders or else. Okay, let's continue. With respect to Germany's request seeking an assurance that the United States would not repeat its unlawful acts, the court took note of the fact that the latter had repeatedly stated in all phases of those proceedings that it was implementing a vast and detailed program in order to ensure compliance by its competent authorities with Article 36 of the Convention and concluded that such a commitment must be regarded as meeting the request made by Germany. Nevertheless, the court added that if the United States, notwithstanding that commitment, were to fail again in its obligation of consular notification to the detriment of German nationals, an apology would not suffice in cases where the individuals concerned had been subjected to prolonged detention or convicted and sentenced to serve penalties. It, to what? Severe. To, to severe, sentence to severe penalties. In the case of such a convention and sentence, it would be incumbent upon the United States by whatever, whatever means it chose to allow the review and reconsideration of the conviction and sentence, taking account of the violation of the rights set forth in the convention. So what happened? In the end, Germany let the United States of America off the hook. Even though the United States of America assassinated, i.e. convicted German nationals in the jurisdiction of the United States of America, Germany let the United States of America off the hook with a promise that they would now correct on the record how do you deal with constant relations as it relates to the United States of America and Germany. However, that's created precedent. Keep in mind, in the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, listen, we learn this in ICJ. When it comes to equality, Moors must treat all Christians with equality. We have to do with Britain. What we do with Britain, we got to do with France. And guess what? Anything the Christian powers do amongst themselves must now comply to Moors. So therefore, these two Christian powers, the United States of America and Germany, have agreed to constant notification that any time a national is in trouble, there are certain things you have to do to follow the course of international law. So in the end, it says what? The right set forth in the convention. So therefore, Moors can always say, we're going to enforce the rights of the convention because the Christian powers on equality must treat the Moroccan Empire the same way. So what's happening? What happened after that? Cost notification access. The United States of America now had to put on the record specific things in writing. It couldn't be their mere expression saying, well, next time we'll do it right. No, they had to put it in writing. So when you look at cost notification access, now you're looking at, go to page 15. Morris must add this to their library. Cost notification access. It gives police, sheriffs, states such as the state of Arizona and the United States specific instructions on how you deal with nationals. How you deal with nationals. How you deal with nationals. Not subjects, not protégés, and not crayons. Nationals. Arresting a non-U.S. citizen. So this is when you get pulled over by a cop or whatever, 
Here's the protocol they're supposed to follow according to what? What the ICJ told the United States of America they had obligations to do because Germany made the United States of America come up with these type of rules. Cop pulls you over. Are you a U.S. citizen? No, I am not a U.S. citizen. This is specific. So what happens? It says, next, this is the cop supposed to be following this, right? When you say no, you're not a United States citizen. The cop is, when you say no, the cop is supposed to stop, stop, make a note in the case file. Step two, do not inform the consulate if they say no to what? Do you want your consulate notified or of your arrest or detention? If the, if the national says no, says make a note in the case file, do not inform the consulate. However, if the national, Moorish national says yes, the cop is supposed to do what? Make note in the case file. Step two, notify nearest consulate without delay. Without delay. Step three, make record notification in case file where fax or email sent, keep fax confirmation or sent email. Step four, allow consular officers access to detainee if they subsequently request access. These are instructions the cops must use. They're supposed to have this on their person at all times. As soon as a Morris is there, Morris National. Everything is supposed to stop. Cops are supposed to follow this step by step. Sheriffs, marshals, you name it. Feds, alphabet boys are supposed to stop when you're a Morris National. Look what Germany asked for. With respect to Germany's request seeking assurance that the United States would not repeat its unlawful acts, the court took note of the fact that the latter had repeatedly, repeatedly stated in all phrases of those proceedings that it was implementing a vast and detailed program, that's a, that's a French word, in order to ensure compliance by its competent authorities with Article 36 of the Convention and concluded that such a commitment must be regarded as meeting the request made by Germany. Nevertheless, the court added that if the United States, notwithstanding that commitment, were to fail again in its obligations of constant notification to the detriment of German nationals, an apology would not suffice in cases where the individual concerned had been subjected to prolonged detention or, or subjected to con conviction or sentenced to serve penalties, to severe penalties. So what's happening? The United States of America and their civil states are obligated to constant notification access, but they're only obligated to nationals. So Moore's out there saying, I'm a Moorish national. Cops are still locking them up. That's when your consular court gets involved. You understand, the United States of America killed, assassinated, prosecuted a German national. Two. Two of them. What make Moors think they're going to get any special privileges because you say the word more? You must understand that Moors, in order to get their rights, we're going to have to learn international law the same way Germany was using it. But Germany allowed the United States to get off the hook. But the United States of America had to turn around and put together things such as constant notification and access. You must understand, with that constant notification and access, listen to me, Morris. As soon as constant notification and access is used, now Morris, through their nationality, constitution, and state, the state gets involved through constant court. Constant court tells the United States of America, since the United States of America has a privileged jurisdiction in our land, you don't have jurisdiction over this matter whatsoever. They can't even pull our Moorish national, if in fact you have a state, into their jurisdiction for prosecution whatsoever. Because the United States of America is in Morocco. Listen to me, Moors. The reason why Germany didn't really have no power is because Germany is way over there in Germany. The United States of America is in Morocco. And you better understand one thing. As soon as Moore started learning how to use consular court to their advantage, the United States of America is going to have to abide not only to our laws, but they're going to have to abide to international law. So if they infringe upon our, our rights, they're infringing upon international law as well. It ain't just Moore's. 
They're infringing upon international law, and they've already been warned. Don't do it again. So, as I start to wrap up, Moors must study international law, build out their library, study how other foreign states deal with the United States of America, use that precedent to our advantage as we learn how to use consular court. Keep in mind, ICJ is nothing but consular court. Let's learn their precedent, okay? Now, one of the things that Moore should start studying Or if we go to this website, it's called the International Court of Justice. Through the International Court of Justice, you can learn a lot about case law on how to deal with all types of subject matters. Over here, it has a tab called Cases. It's a list of all types of cases. If you go to a case, let's say like this right here. Contentious cases organized by state. Let's just click on one of them. So, Moors, go to the International Court of Justice. Here you will find a lot of cases. You go to the drop down menu. Click on any of these drop down menus, menus and you'll see cases that you can study. Cases dealing with all types of racial discrimination, habeas corpus, dealing with disputes of borders jurisdiction, uh, contentious matters, dealing with the interpretation of treaties. The International Court of Justice has their precedent on there. More must study this. The same way we were studying state statutes, we must now start studying international law. The answers to the test is through the International Court of Justice website. The answers to the test is understanding how to use cost of court which is international law. Consular court is not a domestic court. Consular immediately means international, which means you must study international law. All right, so as I wrap up, in order for us to become the United States of Morocco again, we must have discipline, not just desire, but discipline. And where does that discipline start? First step is this. What is the name of your provincial state government? So we can fill this up with more states and eventually become the United States of Morocco again. I end with that. Islam.